All right, welcome back, Chemistry 241, gentlemen. We've got another big day ahead of us, although this one won't be a super long lecture. It'll be a really important one because today we're going to really tie together our discussion of crystal lattices and the way they're bound to a topic from Chemistry 111 that was really, really important called enthalpy, right? That dealt with thermodynamics, and that's going to be really important. So, a um, couple quick notes. Uh, you've got a lab uh, notebook right up that's going to be due um, next on Monday uh, before class. So make sure you read up on Canvas how to do that and get that done because lab is really important for a number of reasons. And uh, we're going to try to move forward and make sure we're engaging you in lab type materials. I know it'll be tough because we can't actually be in the lab anymore because of the whole virus thing. And that's really a bummer. But we're going to do our best to support you so that this class We'll have credit that can count towards you know your med school prereqs or dental school or grad school and you know like we've talked about in class lab is just an utterly essential part of what we do here uh, both in terms of what we cover and just in terms of learning science so we're going to try to be creative and come up with some uh, activities that'll help you um, both understand things going on in class but also give you a, a connection to the more of the practical side of chemistry as well even though we can't get in the lab the labs ourselves so the other thing is uh, keep working on your primary literature article projects those are going to be a big thing a big chunk of points and again that's actually part of your lab grade right that uh, we had a couple lab days devoted towards that which we really can't do anymore but we've still kind of scaffold that assignment out so that you can have uh, plenty of time to work on it. So I think your next due date is Wednesday, April, uh, I think it's like the 13th or the 15th. I can't remember. It's on campus, so go look it up. Uh, but you really need to, at this point, move on and, and get your, your final draft of your paper done. So please do not wait till the last minute. I promise you, you're not going to be able to do good work if you wait till the end. Okay. So the other thing I want to talk about just real quickly, um, we are exactly one week out from your exam. Uh, so exam three is going to be a little bit different. Uh, later today, uh, you will have a quiz, a small quiz posted on Canvas that you'll need to complete. And that format is sort of a, a prototype of what you can expect on an exam. Because what we're going to have to do is essentially uh, put an exam document on Canvas, have you download it, complete it, and scan it using the document scanning apps and upload it in a certain amount of time and get that done. And that's going to be how we do exams. And so we'll have more details later. But um, for right now, you need to start working towards the ability of to do these problems in a good amount of time. Now granted, since you're going to be doing this at home, you'll be able to use your notes or whatever the resources you have in front of you, uh, you know, your text, online textbook and things like that, but you're not allowed to work together. You're not allowed to work with another student, so you're going to have to work on your own. Plus, if you don't know this stuff and you're going to try to look up all the answers, you're just not going to finish. you got to know how to do this stuff like you would uh, pretty much on an exam. But again, you'll be able to use your notes, so it might take a little stress off if you forget our equation or you know something like that. But again, you need to practice. You need to work the homework. You need to get proficient and confident so you can work these and, and earn the highest grade you can. And the last little note um, that I'll, I'll say before I get moving on this topic is that uh, Dr. Cook and I talked about it and we shifted a few points from the final exam. Uh, so now the final exam is worth just a few points uh, less than it was before and your homework has uh, the homework categories received those points. So uh, we're asking you guys to do a lot of these homework activities and so we wanted to give you a little bit more credit on that. Uh, so take a look at Canvas. I've updated all these things and again you got to keep up with Canvas. It's really important. The other thing is I'll try to have office hours uh, later today, so make sure you check Canvas. It's it's on the, the date for the syllabus, so you'll know I think I'm going to try to do it at 1.30 to 2.30 uh, using the Canvas conference function. So I hope to see a few of you drop in. Uh, I didn't have any takers last time, so um, I'm assuming this is all making sense. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Uh, don't know unless you give me some feedback. Okay. So today, as promised, we're going to talk about lattice energies. And this really goes to something that I think is really important. Think about the energetics. What holds these crystals together, right? We talked about ionic compounds in particular having these really, really high uh, melting points. And, uh, you know, they're just held together very strongly. And today we're going to look at putting a number on that. How do we look at that value and how do we connect these uh, values of things that we talked about before and the newer things we've talked about in just in the last few lectures. So let's go ahead and dive right in. So uh, we've got our, our be able to's here. So make sure you can, uh, you know, 
understand all these little bullet points because again, we're getting really close to an exam, so make sure you're, you're getting ready for that. Dr. Cook and I will post, as usual, um, some practice problems, so look for those very soon. And then we will also hold um, some extra review office hours on Canvas conference uh, next week. So take a look at that. Be aware of any announcements as those come. Okay, so first thing I wanna talk about is this idea of uh, why would even we even think that ionic crystals are bound together in the first place, right? We talked a lot about the fact that we have these lattice structures, right? We talked about the various, uh, you know, uh, cubic structures. We really harped on those quite a bit. But why do they hold together? Especially in the last lecture, we talked about, you know, everything from the simple cubic arrangement um, all the way up to something like um, intertwined face center cubics and, and really complicated structures, you know. So why, why are they held together? Well, I think you can appreciate that they're held together because there are electrostatic, right, electrostatic, or often known as Coulombic, right, Coulomb's law, which is essentially stated over here in this equation here. Now, Coulomb's law says that if you have two charges, right, and they are separated by a distance r, so we have a constant c, don't worry about the constant for right now, um, but we're really gonna look at a distance of the separation of two ions, and then we need to look at the magnitude of the charge of the cation and a, the magnitude of the charge on the anion. So this table here shows essentially the lattice energy, which is, we'll talk more about in a minute because I've got a definition on the bottom of the page, but it's essentially um, a measure of how strongly bound uh, the ions are in a crystal lattice, and that's really important, right? And so if you look at some data here, right, you say, okay, well, there's a whole bunch of data here, but it's pretty pretty simple. So let's look at lithium, right? So you got lithium here, and we've got, um, you know, if we go over here, we've got lithium, and we can say, okay, if we have uh, this axis here, the number's getting bigger as we go up the y-axis, right? So bigger values mean that the crystal lattice is more strongly bound together. So if we have lithium, this purple curve here, and lithium bound to uh, fluoride, right? So this point here would be for lithium fluoride. And if you go down, uh, you find down here you have still lithium, right? And in this case, it's gonna be bound to the iodide. So here we have lithium iodide. And so it has a considerably uh, smaller uh, lattice energy. And you might say, well, why is that, right? Why is that bound together uh, in a way that's less um, stable, or you could say it's it's held together less uh, less tightly. And so let's look at Coulomb's law, right? So we could take lithium, and lithium has a one plus charge, so Z plus is going to be one. And iodide, right, is iodine has the one more electron, right? So it's iodide, and so it has a negative one charge, so it's a one to one ratio. So plus one and negative one. There we go. So the strength of the charge is in the numerator. So the the higher the charge, probably the more, um, not probably, but definitely the more attracted those two are based on Coulomb's law. So you could imagine if you went up to something like a magnesium two plus or an aluminum three plus, that would have an even higher attractive force, right? The opposites attract, cations and anions, the higher the charge, the stronger the attraction. What I wanna to point to here though, for this trend that I'm showing you is, I'm gonna focus here on R, which is the radius or essentially the distance, right? So lithium, as you can imagine, right, would be a pretty small little ion. And here you can see the relative size is shaded in this light blue. And the same thing for these anions. The bigger you get, right, you're adding more shelves. And so if you look at iodide, it's a pretty big uh, ion there, and that's a terrible drawing. But you can see here that if you wanted to, you could kind of look at the center, right? If you looked at the nuclear, internuclear distance, that would be our R, right? So if you compare that to something like lithium fluoride, right, those two are gonna be much closer together. And in that case, what happens? Um, and in this case, obviously the smaller R value, since R is in the uh, denominator, as R gets smaller, the lattice energy gets higher, or delta H for enthalpy, we'll talk about that later. So we can just call this energy lattice, right? This is the lattice energy. And so as charge goes up, Lattice energy goes up as uh, radius gets or distance gets bigger. 
lattice energy goes down because you've got a further separation. You want these to get the highest lattice energy. You want these to be the highest charges you can find and as close together as possible. And so if you look at this data, right, if you look at lithium fluoride, those are both one, to one plus cation and one minus anion. So Z plus and Z minus are one each. And the distance between them is pretty small. That's why you have a very large lattice energy. As you begin to drop off in lattice energy, that's a direct effect of the fact that your anions are getting much bigger. We're holding lithium constant. And so that R value is growing, it's getting bigger. And as that gets bigger, um, your energy goes down. Now, if we look at, you know, just going from lithium fluoride to sodium fluoride, to potassium fluoride, we see the analogous effect here where our lattice energy goes down. Why? Because we're keeping, in this case, the fluoride constant, but we're getting increasingly larger cations, but the charge is still the same. The charge is still a one plus. So we're not changing Z plus or Z minus. Those are both ones, but we are changing the, the distance R. And so as you introduce a bigger cation and hold the one constant, you're going to get uh, bigger separation, which is a bigger R, which drives the lattice energy down. And if you want to get like the worst lattice energy, the lowest lattice energy, you would take the biggest cation, the potassium, the biggest anion iodide, and that would give you the largest, at least for this graph, the largest possible distance, which is R, which would make the uh, lattice energy the lowest. So there you go. There's a good way of looking at that. The other thing we could think about was, you know, you could rank these, right? If I give you a few different things, um, you know, if I give you two like lithium fluoride and sodium fluoride, you should be able to predict just using the simple Coulomb's law that I've showed you, the relationship there of distance and charge. If you have the same charges, but you're increasing distance, um, you can see that you could rank them very easily. So that would be a really clever question to put on an exam or something or a quiz or something like that. The other thing you could do, right, if we could trick you and we could say, okay, well, what about something like this? We could have sodium chloride, right, which we know are z equals one and one right because it's a plus one and a minus one and then we could compare it to something like this right magnesium oxide which is going to be a two plus and a two minus and very quickly you can see that um, the z's would change here and you would have a much stronger lattice energy for the magnesium oxide than you would for the sodium chloride now you could actually ask what about the distances right do they matter well they do matter but they're going to be largely on the same scale i mean they don't change that much but you're talking about doubling uh each of the z's right so if you double this from going from one to two and then this is one to two you've essentially um you know increased them both by by 100%. And if you increase them both by 100%, you're really driving that numerator way up, which is going to drive that lattice energy uh, very high. And if you want to be really extreme, right, you could do something crazy like you could have aluminum nitride, which is going to be a three plus and a three minus. And those are going to have some serious, serious lattice energies uh, you could imagine. So as we go from, in this case, left to right, uh, the lattice energy would be going um, quite a bit higher. Um, then we saw, um, you know, one versus two versus three. So pretty simple. Okay. So that was kind of more of the, can we compare a couple things? Can we think about Coulomb's law? Again, in this case, I'm not going to have you solve any actual values for this, but you could. Um, but I just want to show you some comparative ways to even think about just remembering when you're working these problems that it's Coulombic attraction, the electrostatic interactions that hold these ionic lattices together. And that's really important. Um, if you want to look at actually experimentally uh, measuring some of these or determining these lattice energies from real experimental data, it gets more complicated because you're not just talking about the attraction of just one cation and one anion. No, no, no. You're remembering that you're dealing with huge lattices, right? So you've got to think about the attraction over numerous anions and, and cations. And that's a little bit trickier. And so uh, in this case, we're going to have to deal with um, a little bit more intensive experimental data, and this is something you need to know. The lattice energy, or enthalpy, because as you saw above, typically we uh, think about it as enthalpy, the lattice enthalpy, although people will still typically refer to it as the lattice energy. It's the energy required to essentially separate, and this is really important, separate one mole of an ionic, and this is why I, I bold them and italicize them, the solid, into its component ions, not in any state, but in its very specific 
separate them into their gas phase ions, and that's really important. And in order to think about this, we have to remember what enthalpy is, right? Enthalpy, as I put there to remind you, number one, it's a state function, which is gonna be really important. And you might need to remember, what is a state function? Well, a state function is essentially what? It's a computational or a numerical quantity or some kind of, um, typically it's a numerical quantity or, or some other kind of um, relationship that depends not on the path you used to get from initial state to final state, Remember, the only thing that matters for a state function is the difference, right? Where you start and where you begin, or where you start and where you end, excuse me. Uh, where you start and where you end, right? That's all that matters. The, you could take any path, it doesn't matter, and you're gonna get the same answer because all it cares about is the fact that you need to know where you started and where you ended, and that's really important. And the born uh, uh cycles we're gonna do on the next page are a beautiful example of this. Uh, if you remember correctly, we did this in 111, we did this with Hess's Law, where we added different reactions and changed the coefficients, and we were able to calculate reactions we didn't know from reactions we did know, and that was really important. So don't be afraid to go back and look at your notes if you're a little rusty on that. So back to lattice energy. Again, it's really important here. We're gonna take, and this is important, right? This is gonna be an ionic solid, right? And that's really critical. It's an ionic solid. So we're not talking about covalent bonds here. No covalent bonds. We're talking about ionic crystals. And we're gonna take that solid and we're gonna break it up into its component cation and anion. Most importantly, we have to remember in the gas form. That's really important. Now, if you think about this, right? Think about what we just talked about above. If these ions are in a crystal all locked up and nestled together and you know really low energy because they're they're attracted due to Coulomb's law, those opposite charged ions are, are very, very strongly attracted, and we're gonna break them up. And not only are we gonna break them up, but we're gonna break them up and put them in the gas phase from a solid, right? So that should scream to you that that is gonna be an endothermic process, right? That means it is gonna require energy to go in. So if you wanted to think about it, you could think about this as energy plus that, um, giving you the two ions in the gas form. So this is really important. Energy in this case is going to be a reactant. And if that's the case, that every time we deal with one of these, the delta H for this is always gonna be positive, meaning that whenever you have to put energy in, right, this is gonna be endothermic. And that is something we need to remember because signs in thermodynamics are critically important because they tell you if energy is going into a system or if it's leaving a system, and that's really important. And again, knowing the definition of enthalpy is important because we're dealing with heat, the energy transfer in the form of heat, under the conditions of what? Constant pressure, right? Remember that from 111, we talked about that. So that's your Q measured under conditions of constant pressure, right? So delta P equals zero. And the reason enthalpy is so useful is because oftentimes when we work in the laboratory, the pressure doesn't change very much. And so that's really important. Plus, if you remember correctly, we don't have to keep track of all the, the volume change work uh, dependence that we, we really would not like to have to do. Okay, so uh, again, take home message here is some energy plus the salt, ionic salt in a solid form generates um, these gaseous uh, cations and anions and what is the energy that we have to pay to go in? So if you, now you can see it from up above the connection. Again, we talked about in terms of Coulombic law, but now we can say, okay, well, the more energy we require to put in there to break that up into this very specific uh, setting can end up telling us a lot about how um, stable was that crystal lattice or how strongly were those held together, those ions held together. Really important. Okay, so enough talk. Let's go ahead and solve a problem. So you've got a sapling homework that is gonna be really, I think, helpful in helping you think about how to solve these. But essentially what we're gonna wanna do is we're gonna think about how do we solve for the lattice energy of a salt using other experimental data? And I know this table looks kind of scary, but let's break it down. Right now, all we're gonna care about is that I wanna look at the lattice energy, right? What is the lattice energy? And if you notice here, your book does this, and I really don't like it. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just say, you know what? I don't like the way that's, I don't like calculating the negative of the lattice energy. I wanna calculate the lattice energy. 
And so I'm gonna say, if we wanna calculate the lattice energy for cesium fluoride, let's go ahead and write it as the actual lattice energy equation, right? We're gonna take the cesium fluoride and I'm gonna go ahead and write energy. I'm gonna write energy plus cesium fluoride because I wanna remember that energy is a reactant and that's really important. And so we took the cesium fluoride in the solid form, right? Cause that's a definition. And we're gonna break it up into cesium cation in the gas phase plus the fluoride ion in the gas phase. And that is the delta H of the lattice. And that's what we want to solve for. That's what I want to solve for. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this and I'm going to get rid of this negative garbage. Now, again, I, I think Dr. Cook and I have been really, really, really um, upfront about this. There are many, many ways to solve a problem and your online book shows you one of them. And if you like that way, you can solve it that way. But for me, I, I really like to think about definitions and concepts and things that I can do where I don't have to just memorize a flow chart or, you know, and so what I'm going to try to do today is kind of show you a thought process and how we can identify what we want and how we get there. And that's what I'm going to try to do today. So if you don't like the way I'm solving it, not going to hurt my feelings, not going to lose any sleep over it. Totally cool. But I implore you to find a way that works for you. Be confident in that method and don't second guess yourself. Once you find a method that works for you, please use it and stick with it. Okay, so here's the deal. I've got all this other data now that I can use to try to find the lattice energy or the lattice enthalpy. Now, okay, here's the deal. If you look at this, it looks daunting at first because you've got a lot of different reactions here. You've got a lot of different um, numerical values and it, it, it can kind of be scary, right? So. Don't let it be scary, right? Don't let it freak you out. Just kind of sit there and say, okay, what do I want to figure out and what do I have? So I'm not even gonna look at the, the data in front of me right now. I'm just gonna start to draw a picture because I'm a visual person and I wanna draw a picture because it helps me think about organizing what I wanna do. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, okay, I'm gonna say I'm gonna have a y-axis and I'm just gonna call this roughly energy. Um, more specifically, we can call it uh, enthalpy right for h okay and my enthalpy is as we go up it's going to be higher now i'm going to start with something that's really important so i'm going to start at some level here and i'm going to say okay well i'm going to say that this value here is equal to the energy or the enthalpy of my cesium fluoride solid. And you might say, why did I start there? Well, what am I trying to solve for? I'm trying to go from cesium fluoride solid to what? Well, I would like to go to the individual cations in their gas form. Okay, well relative to the solid, where do the individual ions in the gas form sit? Do they, do they sit higher in energy or do they sit lower in energy? Well, I hope I've convinced you previously that if you separate something from a, a you start with a solid crystal that's really, really strongly bound together and you're gonna break it up, and not only are you gonna break it up, but you're gonna put enough energy in to kick these cations into the gas phase, that's gonna be a really high energy situation. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that up here somewhere. I'm gonna say that's gonna be up here where I've got my cesium plus in the gas form and I've got my fluoride negative in the gas form. And I hope you all agree that this is a higher energy state. So if I draw a connecting line from where I was to where I go, right? This is my initial state, this is my final state. What is the value of this? Well, if I went from a enthalpy starting material starting state to a final state, I can, through the beauty of a state function, right, think that the delta H for this step is what? Well, what did we do? We went from a solid ionic crystal in the solid form to its constituent cation and anion in the gas form. That is the definition of the delta H of lattice, or the, the lattice enthalpy, right? However you want to say it, the lattice energy, whatever you want to call it. And I think we all agree then that this has to be positive, right? This has to be endothermic because we're going from a low enthalpy to a high enthalpy state. 
And that's the case, we have to be putting energy in to go from a low enthalpy to high enthalpy. I hope that makes sense. Now, coincidentally, this is what we wanna calculate, right? This is our answer. Do we know this answer? No. Do we have any data up above that can take us directly from one to, from uh, the solid to the gas? No, we don't know that. That's what we need to solve. And here's the beauty of the whole thing. The beauty of this whole thing is that, guess what? It's a state function. So that means that if we can't go directly from here to here, as long as we can find kind of a roundabout way, we'll get the same answer. And that's gonna be something I wanna to prove to you right now. Okay, so let's think about what we have. So we have the solid here. And if you look up above, what do we have? Well, not going very far, you can see here that we have a reaction here. And what does this reaction remind you of? We're taking cesium solid, plus one half of a fluorine, right? Remember fluorine comes as one of the Hofbrinkles, right? It's um, a molecular form of fluorine. You don't find fluorine just by itself. You find fluorine in packets of F2, just like you find packets of H2 or nitrogen two or things like the O2, you get the idea. Check out this reaction. We got this, this, and this. So we're forming one mole of the cesium fluoride from the um, elements in their standard states. Well, do you remember that from 111? That's called the heat of formation or the enthalpy of formation. And the value is actually given to us. And if you look at it, let's just do some thinking here. We're going from these two individual things into a product. And so if you look here, are we going uphill or downhill? Well, in this case, energy is a product, right? Because in this case, this is an exothermic reaction as written, and this is really important. This is where we're gonna use Hess's law, right? So in this case, if we're starting with our little diagram, we're starting with this guy, and we want to begin to work our way around into the individual cation and anions in the gas state, we need to break this up at some point. So maybe this is a good way to break it up. So if we go from cesium fluoride in its solid form, and we could go up here, and we'd get to cesium solid plus one half of fluorine in the gas phase, check that out. Okay, so going uphill this way, we're going from cesium fluoride to its constituent elements in their standard states, that's actually the reverse reaction of what we have here. So if we go backwards, we can flip the sign and it becomes endothermic if we go the other way. So now we see here that this is essentially negative of the delta H of formation, right? And that equals negative one times negative 553.5 5 kilojoules, which equals positive, just like I told you above, 553.5 kilojoules. And it's important here to put per mole because we want to watch our units, right? So that's a kilojoules per mole. Same thing for our lattice energy. Our lattice energy better be, by definition, kilojoules per mole because it's by one mole of, of cesium fluoride. Okay, so right now what we're doing is we're trying to work our way around to go from solid to these products. And so we're, we're a good part of the way there because we've broken up the lattice and we form cesium solid and we've got one half of the fluoride, fluorine in the gas form, but we're not there yet. That We're not there. We have to keep thinking about getting this into the form that's exactly the form over here. So we're close. So if it were up to me, what I might do is say, um, hmm, I've got my cesium separated and my fluorine separated. Maybe I'll go ahead and take the cesium from the solid. I know I need to get into the gas form, so maybe I can put it in the gas form. Well, I think you'll agree, going from cesium solid to cesium gas, right? If we go to cesium gas, that's gonna be an uphill slog for the energy, so that's gonna be endothermic. And so we can say, okay, well, we've got cesium solid uh, going to the gas, right? and I'll try to make that a little bit neater. There's the gas. We're gonna do nothing to the fluorine, so we're gonna keep that just as it was. And now you might ask, how do I find this out? Well, you're gonna go up above in our table here, and I think you can see here, we've got sublimation, right? So we've got solid cesium going to, uh, to the gaseous form of cesium, and that's given to us. And of course, that will definitely be 
an endothermic reaction because you're heating something from a solid to a gas that requires energy as what? Well, the energy here is gonna be a reactant. So there you go, same thing. So if I go back um, down here, I can look up that value. And again, it's positive 76.5 kilojoules for every one mole of cesium. Very good. So we're so close, but again, we're not there. We've got cesium in the gas. We haven't really done anything to fluorine yet. We'll get to that one in a minute, but we need to go from cesium, the at neutral atom to cesium, the cation. And how do you do that? Well, if you look here, we've got up above the ionization energy of cesium. So we can go from the cesium gas to the cesium cation and by removing an electron, right? The ionization energy, really important. If you look at this value over here, that's a positive value, right? That's an, another endothermic because we have to rip an electron away from the neutral atom. It's not a huge value, it's still pretty big, right? But we have to pull that away, so that costs us some energy. So energy is gonna be a reactant again on this side. And we can say, okay, well we can draw that up here and we can say, okay, so now we've got We've got cesium plus in the gas phase, and that's great because that means we've got half of what we need. We haven't done anything to fluorine, so we'll put that still in the same way it was. So all through here, we haven't done anything. We haven't touched fluorine, and we just copy that number. So we can say that's going to be positive 375.7 kilojoules per mole. Now, you'll notice that I'm not being very careful with how big my jumps are related to the number. This isn't to scale. I'm not worried about that. I'm more worried about your ability to show me that you understand, are we going up energy or are we going down in energy? That's what I really want you to show. Okay, we're so close, we're getting there. So now we're done with cesium, right? Because that cesium is in the gas form as a cation. They match, that's really important. So we're halfway there. Actually, we're a little further than halfway there. I'll show you why. Next thing we wanna do is we need to deal with this fluorine, right? So first thing we probably wanna do, and again, the order you do these things in doesn't matter, um, but I like to kinda of get all my positive steps on one side, and then I'll show you I'll do a negative step at the end. So what I need to do first is I need to break up this F2, right? This F2 doesn't help me. And so I don't have a whole mole of it, I only have half a mole, and that's why up above you'll see that you can take the bond energy for F2, right? And remember, you can go look up uh, the dissociation energy of just how strong is a fluorine-fluorine bond. If I had one mole, I could just look up that value. However, in this case, I don't have one mole. I only have a half of a mole. So I have to take one half the dissociation energy, and that value is given here. And again, that's another positive value. Why is that? Because you're ripping a bond apart. Ripping a bond apart requires you to put energy in. Breaking bonds takes work. So we're gonna put energy here. That's gonna be another endothermic reaction. So another endothermic. And that number's given to me. So I can come back down here and I can say, okay, well, that's another uphill slog. I gotta go uphill again. And I'm way over here, right? So now I've got my cesium plus in the gas form. And now I've broken up the fluorine to give me just one fluorine, neutral fluorine in the gas form, and that cost me what? That cost me positive 79.4 kilojoules per mole. Really important. So now, what do we have to do? We, we were good with cesium, we haven't touched cesium since the last step, but we need to basically do what? We need to turn fluorine, the neutral atom, into fluoride, the anion, and how do you do that? Well, you have to give fluorine an extra electron. And fortunately, fluorine, being the most electronegative element on the periodic table, would love to take an electron. And if we look at that here, we can look at the electron affinity, looking at fluorine, the neutral um, atom, gaining an electron to form the fluoride anion. And in this case, this is one of our first examples of an exothermic reaction that we will use as is. And so we need to put energy as a product here. So in this case, what we do is we come down in energy. And in this case, it's gonna be what? It's gonna be negative 328.2 kilojoules per mole. And guess what? We've reached 
that state that we wanted to find. How do we know? Because now we've gone from cesium uh, cation gas, which matches perfectly to what we wanted, and now we've gone from fluorine, the neutral atom, we've added an electron, and that gives us exactly what we want, that fluoride, right? And there we go. Now we need to be really careful to keep an eye on our signs, because that's really important. Don't forget your signs, your signs that are really important. So now check it out. We could not go directly from cesium fluoride, the solid, to its cation and anion in a gas state directly. We couldn't measure that. We had no data, no experiment that would give us that exactly. So what we did was we used the fact that enthalpy is a state function and we found an alternate path. And as long as we can find one path, the fact that enthalpy is a state function means we'll get the same answer as if we'd taken the direct path. And this is really cool. So now all we have to do is take the summation of all of these steps that we did, that alternate path to get to where we wanted to be, and it will give us this final answer. So if you add all of those steps up, that so add positive 553.5, add positive 76.5, add positive 375.7, add positive 79.4, minus, right, or plus a negative 328.2 kilojoules, and that should give you your final answer of positive and that's important because we knew that had to be endothermic. If you get a negative number, you've done something wrong. 756.9 kilojoules per mole. Per mole of what? Cesium fluoride solid. That is your final answer. And that, gentlemen, I think is pretty badass because we took something that we could not calculate directly and we've taken published data that you can look up in tables, or if we give you these values on an exam, you can find a path. Now, did we have to do them in that order? No, because it doesn't really matter. However, I think that that path made sense for me in terms of thinking about starting with what we had and working our way slowly to what we wanted to get for our products and keeping track of each step along the way. I'll expect you to be able to do this. It's really important. So please make sure you practice the homework. There are two really good problems, plus your reading, your online reading has some example problems as well. So there's no excuse that you have for not trying to do this on your own and building some confidence. Again, you'll see one of these kinds of problems on an exam, I, I promise you. So please make sure you understand what's going on here. Now again, I'll give you the disclaimer. If you find a different way that you prefer to use to solve these, as long as you show your work and it makes sense, I will award you full credit. However, this one I think works pretty well for me. I know it doesn't match your book exactly, but I think it makes more sense just in my weird little brain in terms of, you know, I'm a simple guy, I like to graph things and see them visually, so I hope this makes sense for you. So anyway, I'll have some office hours and you have examples on your homework and there will be a quiz um, later today. The quiz will only cover, um, it won't cover today's lecture, it'll cover the material up until today. Um, so. Go ahead and uh, give it a shot and see how you do. Um, again, this is a good example of using a quiz to figure out kind of where you are. Do you need to work harder? Are you pretty confident? Because that exam is going to come pretty fast. It's only a week away. So anyway, take care and be strong. Uh, be well, be safe, and I'll talk to you soon.